Welcome and thank you very much for joining us on episode 154 of the Blazer's Edge podcast presented to you today by blazersedge.com. I'm your weekend host, Chris Lucia. And I'm your weekend co-host, Brandon Goldner. Yeah, so this weekend, uh, the edition of the podcast is a very special show. Uh, we're very excited to bring on former Portland Trailblazer Martel Webster, who's going to be talking uh, not only about his basketball career, uh, but also about a mixtape that he's releasing uh, today, in fact, that you can actually find on a number of different sources. We'll, we'll give you the information on where you can find that. But we do want to give you a quick prefer- preface uh, before we start the podcast, just to let you know, uh, this was a very, uh, I guess, casual interview, and the language uh, reflects that kind of uh, that attitude. So, uh, if, there was a little bit of cussing, is what Chris is trying to say. Exactly. So, if if PG thirteen uh, language, uh, if that's something that you're sensitive to, you might want to tune in uh, next week to episode one fifty five and skip this one. But if that's something you can handle. This was an amazing interview with Martel. He absolutely uh, went into a lot with the music, with the basketball. It's definitely interesting. So, Yeah, it was a great interview, and we definitely appreciate his time. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with us for any reason at all, uh, you can shoot us an email at blazersedgepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can always check our stuff out on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, and Google Play. And just to say that Martel's mixtape dropping today, it's called Art, and you can find it on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, all the usual places. So go check it out. Joining Brandon and I this week on the Blazer's Edge Weekend Podcast is former Portland Trailblazer, Minnesota Timberwolf, and Washington Wizard Martel Webster. He's got a mixtape coming out today called Art. Uh, it's dropping on his Eris record label under his name, Martel Webster. Martel, thank you very much for joining us, man. Chris, I really appreciate it. you guys allowing me to be on the show. Brandon as well. Um, glad to be here. Excited to talk about uh, everything. Excellent, man. We're, we're really excited about it, too. And, and I want to jump right into it. So I want to talk about music first. And then for the listeners, we'll talk a little bit about your time playing basketball and everything. But let, let's jump right into it. I want to talk about some of your early influences. So I read uh, in a piece earlier that uh, early on, you know, getting into music, some of your earliest memories were of uh, listening to your uncle's jam band and just kind of sneaking in and uh, hearing what they were doing. And you also had uh, you as well as uh, some other younger family members of yours uh, had that old school Fisher Price little yeah. cassette tape recorder in you guys would kind of drop rudimentary beats on that and rap yeah. over that. Uh, so can you walk us through, you know, growing up uh, in Seattle, having a family that was involved in music? What was that like? What, how did that influence your uh, interest in music? Honestly, they were just outlets, really. Um, not, not one or the other was ever forced upon us. It was, they were just kind of things that were happening around my grandmother's house and then next door neighbor. Our next door um, was my uncle's house, so it was kind of convenient just to have him literally a couple feet away. And, uh, you know, twice a week, um, you know, sometimes three times a week, he'd have his boys come over and they'd set up, you know, their little jam sessions. You know, they'd have, you know, a three-piece drum, uh, you know, bass, guitars, electric guitars. My uncle played uh, electric guitar. So, and they'd come over there and just uh, jam out. A couple dudes would bring a trumpet or a sax, and, you know, they'd just kind of bump out. And, uh... He would always leave the door open because um, he just didn't really care about you know what any of the neighbors would say. He just have the doors open, let the music kind of bleed out. So I just kind of wander over there. Me and my little brother, you know, my cousins from time to time, will go over there and just kind of sit down and watch him play. And he would like tell us to come over and like hit a string for him, and it, it was super dope. And you know, and over at my grandmother's house, which was an oasis basically for anybody to ever come, uh, rest in peace. I mean, she just passed away. She was ninety four years old, but she used to take care of like. 50, 60 people, you know, growing up. Um, throughout that whole entire timeline, people would come in, drop their kids off. She would take care of them for, you know, half of the summer, a couple weeks, whether it be, there would always be, the door would always be open. So my Aunt Sharon came and stayed with us, and, you know, she brought her vinyls, all her vinyl, um, you know, records over, crates, and she would just set up in the house. You'd be listening to Al Green, you know, Stylistics, Marvin Gaye, of course, and, um, you know, Aretha Franklin. And so there will always be music going at all times, no matter what. 
And uh, that was just something that was always amazing about my grandmother's house because growing up, she during the prohibition and in times like that, and then you know, fast forward into like the civil rights movement, like she actually World War Two to, to be more to be more um, to be more exact, and when she had her little operation in the house, which she would just uh, have people that came in, longshoremen, people that would base here. Her husband would go pick them up, and they would come over, and they would do like gambling in the house, and then she would fry up catfish and stuff like that. So they'd buy that, and if they got too drunk at the house, she had a bar in the house. <laughs> then she would allow them to stay over, and then my grand, my my great grandfather would take them back uh, to base in the morning. So that's how they would like get money coming in, and so it was just all these crazy things that kind of went on in my house, and just kind of supplied to the life and, and longevity of that place. And you know, it's things that kind of just bled into me and, in, and into my culture as I as I grew older. But music has always been like the staple of of, of my house growing up. So first of all, I just want to say, I mean, you mentioned Marvin Gaye. What's going on? is one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah. Just how, how everything, you know, like connects to the next song, like thematically. And just, just everything that's going on in life in general is, has that thing that's, you know, kind of omnipresent and timeless. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a dope album. Yes, uh, it the, is. the other thing I wanted to ask, I mean, I, you're describing when your uncle would, would set up. I mean, I used to be around my brother who was in a band and during like their intermissions, I would jump on uh, the kit and just play a little bit. You know, did you That's ever sick. get? A, yeah, did you That's ever get sick. a chance to like jump on and just like play with those guys or anything like that? Not, I around? never got to jump on the kit, um, but you know, you know, dealing with you know anger management and everything, and I have my mom around. My uncle actually bought me a drum kit and, and had it in the basement, so I used to go down there and just bang on it with no particular rhythm or any type of teaching. But it's crazy that you say that because I have the drum set down um, stairs in the studio. And actually the last couple of days I've been going down there and just kind of playing. Um, and, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy how much of a rhythm you can actually get into and just doing music and making music and kind of set your own rhythm. Um, so it's been fun playing the drum kit and seeing how good I could actually be at it if I actually put some time into it. And it's super, it's therapeutic to tell you the truth. So I, I have to ask Martel, you being a guy from Seattle and growing up in the time you did, Sir mm. Mix-a-Lot was pretty big. He was a Seattle guy back in yeah. the day, back back when you were a youngster. Was he any kind of an influence on you growing up? <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably responsible for my fascination in asses, I guess. <laughs> um, no, no different than you know than he was for anybody else growing up in that time you know really honestly we didn't i didn't get into the whole record shop thing until i was about 12 years old and that was a little bit after mr mix had his kind of reign um but i remember just that whole experience of going to a tape shop and, you know we had a record shop that was right on the corner um of my street and me and my cousin who was the one that used to we that's where we'd go and get blank tapes to put into our Fisher Price joint and kind of go cram. Um, I, that's the first time I met uh, 112. 112 that came by and they did, a tape, they did a signing, a cassette signing, and I got a tape signed by them. And, I, you know, I didn't really, was never really starstruck, you know, by any mu musicians at all. So seeing them was just like, okay, there's a band here and it's 112. I've heard their, their songs on radio, but I had never gotten into a point where, like, the kids are now as, like, completely fanatics. Um, but that was really cool to see 112 live in person. And, um, but yeah, man, the culture of music has has evolved. You know, Sir Mix a lot. You know, I grew up listening to a lot of Bone Thug and um, N.W.A. somewhat here and there. Dr. Dre for sure, Snoop Dogg, Eminem. Honestly, is to tell you the truth, is what really kind of got me into music. Um, I listened to him. I remember when he first came out, I was in seventh grade, going to eighth grade. I'm like, yo, who is this dude? And didn't necessarily have a color until I started seeing the music videos, and I was like, oh, it's a white boy too doing this shit. I was like, damn. <laughs> And uh, kind of, yeah, he, he really kind of got me into to rap. And, you know, my cousin, my older cousin was probably solely responsible for introducing me to it. My cousin Stallone, I talk about him in, in um, a couple of my songs coming up on the ED project, Emerald District project that is uh, produced by Jake One and um, collab with Airs, uh, Airs Music here as well. But, um, yeah, man, you know, Sir Mix-a-Lot, Tech 9 um, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Twista. You know, which come to find out there's a reason why he resonates with me because my mom, my mother's side of the family's from Chicago, so Twista is a big time. Uh, him and um, I forget what the name of his his group was, 
I'll remember it. But uh, yeah, I was into that Jay Z, of course, Lil Wayne as I got a little bit older. But my staple was probably Eminem, Snoop Dogg, um, Twista, Bone Thugs and Harmony. That's kind of what got me into it. That's interesting because Twista and Bone Thugs they have that incredibly fast cadence. Yeah, and Eminem also has his really own uh, interesting, unique cadence as well. And you you. Mentioned guys like Dr. Dre and Soup Dog, that West Coast stuff that was way more laid back than that stuff that was coming out of Chicago at the time True. Uh, with Twista. And then I think it was Kansas City with Bone Thugs. It was, it was Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, there we go. So somewhere in the Midwest I got. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, so there's, there's definitely like a convergence there of several different styles that influenced you early on. Yeah. And then you could see all the, all the kind of um, bands that kind of fall in that same genre um of quirkiness and you know uniqueness and avant-garde music like Busta Rhymes like of course I would be you know I, I would gravitate to him you know Tribe Call, Call Quest Q-Tip more more so importantly I was a big fan of Q-Tip um I loved his music and his style and you know that that old polished sound is is kind of like what I go for in, in my music today but I also understand like the crossover appeal. So there's things I've grown on. Like Drake, of course, I think is one of the most amazing artists just based on being being a person to transcend uh, hip-hop artists and be able to do like Neo Soul and go into R&B and then into like reggae and that, that um, I guess, that channel or that, that crossover appeal uh, was really amazing just because I grew up singing. Who didn't? Everybody was in the shower, the shower and that that reverb and the acoustical sound that you are, you always sound better when you're in showers. So everybody wants to sing. And, um, I think, you know, people, you know, stepping forward and just kind of doing it on a monumental scale just made it a lot easier and for people just to be like, okay, kind of like, fuck it. I'll just be myself and, you know, go out there and put the music out that I like. And, um, you know, one of those things are, are that's very important for me, you know, being inspired and to go out and do music in my own creative way. So I, I wanted to ask about the process of putting together this mixtape, uh, that's, that's dropping today. Um, sometimes when you create music, what you hear in your head <coughs> and like the concept for your song <coughs> can be yeah. a little bit different from what actually comes out on the track. I wanted to ask you how close did you get to matching what was in your head to what's coming out today? I mean, was that a struggle for you or was it kind of like an exploratory process where maybe the beginning didn't really match what ended up in the end? Is that kind of what was going on? Yeah, uh, of course. You, I think every, I can't speak for everybody, but I went through that process, of course. I mean, you know, it comes out, what you hear in your head isn't necessarily what comes out on record. Um, so you just kind of go back and find detailed things. And it's no different than you know being on the basketball court in any profession. Um, you're going to go in and there's going to be times where you get a product back and it's just like, nope, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. And that, that goes with anything. You know, that, that could be... You can judge it on a scale of how you practice that day. Like, I wanted to work on this one move and it didn't work out that well. Okay, well, let me go back and tweak it so that I can come back tomorrow and perfect it. It's, it's no different with music. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's some people that have, that have been in the zone and gone in there and did it in one take. I mean, that's amazing. Um, but for the most part, with anything, if, if, if everybody were to go back and critique themselves and look back at how they perform and were able to go do it over again, I'm pretty sure there would be some minor tweaks here and there. Um, that's just the nature of it. And the mixing thing, you can get really lost in that where you can do one mixer or a sequence of mixes and then all of a sudden you come back after about two or three days and you're like, oh my God, it, it sounds a lot better if I do it this way. When it, all, when it, when it actually sounded amazing the way it was and that's why you kind of got to give yourself a deadline because you can get kind of caught in those wormholes and, and get lost in, in things. So, you know, I definitely had those moments where I was like, let me go back and do that again. I didn't like the way that sounded or let me completely cut this arrangement out. Yeah, that, and that's the fun part about it, too. So I enjoy that process. And you mentioned earlier that you had worked with, um, on a separate mixtape, Jake One, yeah. who, had, who had produced for 50 Cent, uh, Common, Rick Ross, some pretty big names uh, in hip-hop. Yeah. What, what was that like, working with a guy who had worked with so many other big names? Um, it was an honor, honestly, to tell you the truth. But the, honestly, to tell you, the three degrees of separation was really crazy. So, <clears throat> you know... I only got into, you know, finding out who produced a track and, and everything after I met Neil, just kind of like him making beats. Neil Vontali actually is, got the heads up and the go ahead to go ahead and chop, do some of the chops to Jake One's beat. So super, it was super homage that he allowed, uh, allowed him to do that. Um, but one of the craziest things that I, that, I, that I found out through that process 
is, you know, you go crate digging, and then you, the people that make uh, beats and sample a lot, they look on, the, look at the back of those vinyls, who produced what, who was in the arrangements, and Neil can listen to a record. You put a record on, and he'll tell you <laughs> who it is, just like that. Um, just because in that realm, everybody kind of works with the same music. Um, so it was really crazy seeing those beats come in, and Neil would just be like, "Oh my God, yeah, he sampled such and such," and then go back and be like, "Yeah, see, look," and he'll play the original, the original sample, and he'll be like, "Oh wow, that's crazy." Um, but it, it it was really cool, man, uh, making music with with Jake. And the three degrees of separation is he used to run with my cousin. So I remember the day before we went to the studio in Seattle. Taylor, who's the president of the label, came to me and was like, yo, you know, Jake's done a lot of music, man. You should look up his catalog and whatnot. And this is like kind of right before we were going in. And I was just like, you know, I don't want to go in and, and just be like, yo, I, I read up on all of this stuff and now I know who he is. And I, I just went in organically and be like, yo, I've heard, you know, the Three Kings beat that you did for Rick Ross and then one of the other beats that he did for Drake. And I was like, honestly, that's all I've heard, man. I've never really been into seeing who produced a track. That's just not my realm. And he's like, he cut me off. He's like, yo, Martel, man. He's like, <laughs> He goes, you don't remember me? And he goes, he's like, yeah. He's like, you used to live in the blue house on 24th Avenue uh, with your grandma, right? I'm oh, like, shit. hold the fuck up. I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And he goes, Stallone, man. He's like, I was, he's like, I was the white boy that used to always ring on your doorbell and ask if Stallone was there. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit, that was you. So Jake, like three degrees of separation is really like one degree. And um, like we hit it off immediately after that, straight into like vibing, talking, kind of catching up. You know, seeing what's going on in his life. You know, he has his daughter. You know, I have four daughters. And kind of, like, talked organically. And it was super cool. And um, it was organic. And he just started playing beats. We just transitioned into listening to beats. And I was just like, wow, this is actually really happening right now. This is really cool. And, um, you know, we ended up, you know, getting a, a batch of beats. And we picked through them and found the ones that the six that we liked. And we went from there, man. So that experience was really cool. But it was more special for me because it was organic. It wasn't anything that was like, okay, you know, read up on your homework, see who this guy is, so you know who you're messing with. It was more like, okay, wow, we are actually closer than, than, than we actually thought. So that process was great. And now we have a project and, you know, a body of work that we did. And it's a beautiful art. So it, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing process. So Martel, if we're going through kind of the history here, of NBA players who have kind of turned to rapping at some point, uh, either during or after their career. I mean, you have uh, Shaquille, Kobe Bryant, C. Webb had Gangsta Gangsta back in the early 2000s. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that, you know, listening to a lot of that stuff, I know Iverson too as well, uh, Jules, I think it was, 40 bars. Yeah. And, and, you know, listening to some of that stuff back in the day, some of those guys, I think they lacked kind of an authentic, authenticity or maybe an earnestness mm -hmm. uh in in their music and i think you know listening to your mixtape a little bit before doing this interview i noticed listening to that it, it felt like you weren't necessarily an nba guy first and then a rapper it, it, it sounded to me like rap was something that came pretty naturally to you so is that stigma of nba players uh you know moving on to rap does that affect you in any way, and, and how do you avoid that? Well, I, I think about it like this, man. It's so funny, man, that, um, you know, rap in general gets such a, a bad rap, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> and that's the fact that, okay, as spectators and critics, we can go look at, you know, I, I, I've said this to my friends and close friends and um, my, my family. I'm just like, okay, it's funny how, you know, Johnny Depp can go act out a role where he's a gangster and he's shooting up everybody's family. And then they, they give them a standing ovation and applaud and an Oscar to go along with it. But then when they hear rap, they can't have the same imagination with that. Like, oh, it's just, it's just entertainment. They can't distinguish between the two. It's like rap is so bad and it gets a bad rap. And yet alone, you get a superstar to play an evil villain or somebody that's notorious and infamous for killing people and you know, ending families. And they, they get the standing ovation. So it's like the same thing kind of <coughs> caters into basketball and be, being being an artist like a, a rapper like when you in when you come step back and you look at everything in its an entirety it's an art basketball is an art form like the way we move like people there's shit that not everybody can do it's an art and but everybody can do it at the same time it's us as spectators are, are what distinguish the level in between what makes something a better or not so good or average when they forget about the whole entire big picture which is that it's art so Shaquille O'Neal making music, 
uh, Kobe Bryant uh, making music, um, Lou, Lou Williams making music, you know, Chris Webber, Damian Lillard. Like, th these guys can actually make music. Like, I even heard Kevin Durant rap. Like, they can make music. Like, if you were to take the acapella of, of Kobe, get the BPMs, and go put it to some different beats, like some trap style beats or neo soul or anything else, I bet you can make it sound really good. So I think what it, when it comes down to that, I, I really don't see, it doesn't really affect me because I have the mentality of looking at, looking at it in the way of, you know, Johnny Depp acting and, you know, a rapper acting. I look at it as nothing but art. So you got to have the mentality in which you listen to it because at the end of the day, all we want to do is be entertained. As consumers, we don't know what the hell we want. We just not want something and we know it. So it's up to us to, as artists, you're not supposed to be responsible for anything else other than putting the art out there. So it's up to people who listen to it to decide how it resonates with them. We well, talk about that connection between music and basketball, and there's this quote that applies to jazz. <coughs> I can't believe I can't remember who said it, but it's, it's something like, you know, learn the instrument, learn the music, forget all that shit and play. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm wondering, is that the same thing with basketball, too? Like, do you just you work, you work, you work, and then when you're on the court? Like, I mean, obviously there are systems, but like, mm -hmm. like how much of that is, is, is you improvising and just, you know, looking, looking at what's in front of you and, and adapting to it and reacting to it, making other people react. I just wonder the push and pull of that. That's life. I mean, and when you think about it, it's well, all you're describing is the yin yang symbol is a balance. Everything's a balance. So like, that's one of the things that's taken out of, of the art and out of sports in general. They're not letting people jam. We we're talking about jam sessions. Now it's about here's a simps system. If you guys don't get it right now, well, then we need to replace you and get the people that who can run it. And yep. it's all about return on investment and profit. And back when you know Jordan and all those guys were playing, it was about the jam session. That's why the team stuck together for seven to eight years, and then they figured it out. You know, now we're in a in a in a in a state where it's we need results right away, and that's in the music. Um, um, world as well, you know, in all arts, in all of the arts, like everything is on a time timeline. If the results aren't then and there, then it's we're sweeping it under the rug and we're going to start over again. Which I I understand, I get it. It's a game. If you're playing the game, then you're playing the game. But you know, soon, once mu music went digital, that was it. It was like yo, now people are getting music whenever the heck they want it and they want it then and there and then now you have different streaming services like before it was just like you go up to tower records or you go up to the to the up the street uh record shop and you get your tapes or your cds and now you then it evolved into target and to circuit city and to best buy and to all of this and then it went digital and once it went digital it was like okay so you mean to tell me all I have to do is hit accept or buy now and that's it okay well if that's the case well, I'm going to get it from Tidal, I'm going to get it from Apple Music, and then, oh, I can get it for free, I'm going to SoundCloud, or I'm going to Spotify or Pandora, and it's like, now you're kind of missing out on the jam sessions, and honestly, to tell you the truth, the closest thing to that and getting that music in its raw and its most organic form is SoundCloud, so like, I spend more time on SoundCloud than I do anything else, because it's like, that's where people go to experiment, and to really like have those jam sessions and get to hear great music, but then, you know, I'm I have a subscription to Tidal and to Apple Music because there's just certain things and certain perks and amenities that you get from, from, from buying something that are really cool. But when you step back and look at it all, it's all part of the same pot. And the, and the, and the best way I can explain it is kind of like how I'm into like the whole tech side um, on trying to get everything linked up from my Twitter all the way to my Instagram, all the way to my YouTube and my Facebook fan page. And, and it, the experience that I can compare it to was the Portland Auto Show that was here. The way they set it up this year was that it was an experience. It's like you couldn't go say, oh, I'm going to just cut out of this and then go back over here and cut through and go to the exotic cars. You had to literally follow this channel. And that's kind of like the same way that I'm trying to get people to experience what's going on with my music and you know videos aesthetically and what's going on with my family. Not just like all these different stop shops. Figure out a way to get them all interconnected because there's times where we all get on our computer and you get sucked into a wormhole. And you're just next thing you know, you're, you're looking up, you know, golf swings, and then you end on a, <laughs> a, 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 a Bluetooth smoker smoking grill. So it's like yep. you want to try to get people uh, the most fluid experience when they get into that wormhole of searching stuff. So 
have you ever considered doing like uh like performing like rapping with like live backing because that's something i've always wanted to do is like provide hip-hop drums for someone so i'm not saying you have to hire no just kidding but like have you ever like <laughs> thought like you know getting your buddies together and doing like live live hip-hop something like that absolutely i did that actually so i played in um the seafair last year show and um, it was a live band. I did a hip hop show uh, that had live band behind it, so all live performance. And you had trumpet player, sax, you know, bass, guitar, electric, and drums. So it was really fun, man. And honestly, yeah. to tell you the truth, when you're up there, man, it makes the experience that much better because you get to you get to feed off, and vice versa, they feed off the energy that is put out there. So I mean, live performance. That's why I mean, I, I enjoy watching you know Jay Z unplugged or watching a lot of Kendrick's performances, man. Um, like. They're amazing. Drake as well. Uh, Maxwell. Like all these guys, when they have their live performances, you can't, can't beat it. I saw Miguel in South by Southwest this year on total accident. Didn't even know he was going to be uh, playing at, this, uh, the, at the tent that I was at. I think it was, the, it was a Spotify house. It was a Spotify tent, and uh, he ended up coming out, and I got some great pictures. Um, I love photography, too. so um, I got some great pictures, but I got to see him perform live, and there's, there's nothing like it. You hear things on the radio, and it's like, yeah, that's an amazing amazingly produced uh track but then we see it in live form where there's a live instrumentation behind it yeah uh, second to none yep uh one last question here real quick about music and then we'll transition to talking about basketball a little bit uh so last summer you had a sold out show in portland mm -hmm. at holocene and i think it, i believe it was march or april you played you mentioned at south by southwest that's a pretty big music event so uh, i, I want to know uh, first off, what's what's the difference there between being on stage uh, performing live uh, between that and playing in front of 20,000 people, uh, you know, watching you play basketball? And also, do you have any plans uh, for any upcoming shows coming up soon? Yeah. So to answer the last question first, uh, um, we have our one year party, August 12th, which is at Evergreen. Um, and uh, that's going to be our like basically celebrating one year um, of airs. So I will be performing again there uh, for sure. That'll probably be the last one for me of the summer. Um, but if anything else comes up, I'll for sure get you guys in contact with like my social media page and directly, of course. But yeah, well, we'll be performing again. Um, and I would say comparing, you know, performing live you know, music, musically, and uh, as to playing on the court in front of twenty thousand people. It's very similar, but it's very different at the same time. Meaning that okay, I'm okay with being in front of large crowds. But the way you the way you feed off of energy is different. When you're on the court, you're feeding off your teammates. You know, most of the time, unless you're at a you're at a home game. If you have a home game, then you can feed off the crowd. That's really fun. I'm not gonna lie. There have been a, even when I was with the Blazers, been a part of some amazing historical comebacks. Uh, I think one of the best ones that I ever had was um, playing against uh, New Orleans um, when uh, CP was still there, and uh, we were down like 30 going into the fourth quarter, and we came back and win that game. <clears throat> and if it wasn't for the crowd, that wouldn't have happened. Mm. So if feeding off of the crowd is, 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 is cool on, in basketball as long as it's, long, it's a home game. But most importantly, it's feeding off the energy of your teammates. But then on music, it's about interacting with the crowd. That's where you get your energy from. And honestly, it'll, it would only be replicated if, um, if you're putting it out there for people to enjoy it. And getting yourself comfortable in front of a lot of people to perform, you know, words that you have to recite over and over again, that is, that's different. That's more of a, of an experience than anything, because now you have to like, it's kind of like a character, because there's going to be times just like basketball, where you don't feel like getting out there and doing anything. You don't have the energy and um, you have to make it happen. I think it's more importantly just looking back and realizing the fact that, yeah, I may be tired. Just realizing it. Don't, don't try to make an excuse for why it is. And once you realize that you actually are, and it's like, okay, you just internalize that. That's what it is. And then you just go out there and do it. Because like, there have been times where I perform, and I was like, I don't want to be up here right now. <laughs> um, but you get up there, and then you'll see, once you kind of like put the energy out there that, that you would want to get back from it, it'll, it'll happen, man. And I think more so with me, I'm an engaging person, like eye contact, and it's kind of how I am as a person in general. Like, I'm going to be looking you in the eye and trying to really figure out what's going on with you. And that's how I perform. I like to interact with the, with the crowd. I might single somebody out that I can just tell is a little uncomfortable. And then I'll, <laughs> I'll spit like six bars looking right at that person. That's how you have to do it, man. You have to like go out there and kind of be a fiend for it. 
So, so you were drafted in 2005. You were part of that last uh, class of players who uh, were eligible to come straight out of high school. You were drafted early on in the lottery to a Portland Trailblazers team at the time mm-hmm. that had kind of a reputation. I'm sure you're familiar with the term the Trailblazers. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to say, I had to bring it up. Um, <laughs> it's okay. And and we're you know we're no strangers to the transition that the team made. Uh, you know from the early 2000s to the mid 2000s and and after with uh, guys like you and Wesley and Brandon Roy and LaMarcus yeah. Aldridge uh, to where they kind of got back into the good graces of the city. Uh, I, w- I want to ask Martel, what was that transition like coming into that situation and then uh, being uh, actually embraced by the city later on? Well, it kind of felt like a bastard child coming into it because one, we came in without a head coach. <laughs> so when I got drafted, we were still looking for a head coach. Like we didn't, we were coachless. Like going into summer league, we didn't have a coach. So and uh, kind of like I think it was literally like a week before summer league, we flew out to Vegas is when they announced you know Nate McMillan being the coach. So it's like this complete rebuilding phase that they went through. And um, you know, it's fun, man. Development is is fun, man. Especially after having, you know, me, me and my wife, we have four daughters, man. So we know about developing, like, kids and raising them up to, you know, eventually be independent. And, you know, we were a bunch of kids that got, you know, drafted, you know, young team um, at heart. We had a couple old heads, but, you know, they had bad raps. You know, Zach Randolph and Darius Miles. And then you had, um, you know, Ruben, um, we had, what's his name? Ruben Patterson. Um, they had some good, there's some good veteran pieces that they kept. You know, it's in order to kind of mold the younger, the younger generation into the, to the way that they wanted the organization to go. And being a part of that was really cool. It was being a part of like a, a brotherhood. Um, so, I mean, rebuilding phases and starting from scratch is, is something that's it's hard, man, because it's a lot of communication. It's a lot of, of understanding of different personalities and compartmentalizing one's feelings just for the greater good of the team. And, You know, it can be stressful um, sometimes, you know, us managing our little team over here and, you know, but it's, it's fun. It's worth it because what it does is build your, it builds your character and kind of builds who you are as, as a person as well. And in your uh, 10 year career in the NBA, uh, I want to ask who was the most difficult dude to guard uh, in practice and in games? Um, Brandon, uh, now he wasn't very difficult to hard uh, to, to guard in, in, in practice because he kind of had his own flow and which he which he went about practice. Practice was necessarily it wasn't necessarily something that he would use to get better from a five on five standpoint. It was more of the the personal drills, outside drills that we did, like doing moves and having to guard a couple dribbles. He's by far the hardest because he has a change of pace that is unlike anybody else's. Um, outside of Portland, probably the hardest person I've ever had to guard is is. It's a tie, honestly, to tell you the truth, between Kobe Bryant and Allen Iverson. Um, those are two of the most shifty, craftiest, you know, veterans and legends that I've ever played against. Um, no one take anything from LeBron. He's just, he's a bull in a china shop, though. I mean, it's still an amazing talent. Can get the job done, obviously, has shown that three times. Um, but I would say it's a tie between Kobe and, and Allen Iverson. So, Martel, you scored... Uh... <coughs> 24 points in a quarter uh, when you were with the Blazers, which I'm pretty sure is uh, second most in franchise history behind Terry Porter, which is just insane. I think I think Dame beat that though. With 26. Oh, did he? Oh, Dame wow. 26. Yeah. Okay. Still, still, that's that's ridiculous. I wanted to ask. I mean, what does that feel like, right? I mean, you're playing against the best players in the world to go off like that in such a short amount of time. What did like like what what is it that you're feeling? Uh, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I can't even imagine. I think the closest way I can relate to it is kind of me going back and picking up the basketball for the first time and emulating Michael Jordan down at the park with nobody guarding me. You're just in your own, you're just in your own zone. I mean, it's no disrespect to the people that are guarding you because you're elite athletes for a reason, but it's just when you get into a zone, it doesn't matter how good you are um, as a defender, is you're in the zone. I mean, I think Clay. I think the, the one of the most amazing, you know, performances I saw was Clay Thompson's 37 point quarter. Um, like you get into a zone and it doesn't matter where you catch the ball, how you catch the ball, where your feet are set up, you just let it go and it's going in. Do your do your teammates pick up on that? Like how quickly did they pick up like oh easy. Yeah, it, yeah, as soon as you okay. as, as soon as you knock down two two or three shots in a row it's like okay, hot hand, 
and it's big. We call them we call them heat checks in, in in this in this game. And the only reason, and sometimes those aren't necessarily a good thing because you can shoot yourself right into a hole and and really mess up the chemistry um, of the team and the in the flow of the game. But then there's instances where it's like, okay, Brandon had went down. Uh, he got injured uh, going into halftime, and it's like, okay, what's going to happen? And you know, the opportunity presented with the great screens that Lamarcus and and Joel Prisabilla. We're, we're setting those amazing screens, and I was getting open, so I was like, okay, if I'm getting time to sit, get my feet set, well, I'm just going to let it fly. And once, you know, a couple went in, then it came to, like, me, you know, going off the dribble and being comfortable because you're just in a zone. It's like you, it, all, all, all you see is a, a basketball a hoop that's 25 feet wide. <laughs> you're just throwing <laughs> it up there, and it's going in. That's like a cheat code on an NBA, NBA hang time or NBA jam. Um, but it's it's fun, man. It's a great zone to be in. And you you've all seen the Kia commercial for, with Blake Griffin in the zone. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. That's it's so funny. They had that perfectly. It's like everything's slow motion. The game slowed down. But it's fun, man. You know, my wife watching highlights of my wife uh, play soccer. Um, that was probably one of the most amazing things. Just kind of seeing her and her little element in her zone. It's kind of having an out of body experience and watching yourself. That's what I can compare it to. I, you know, I was, I was looking up your basketball reference and I actually have a couple of questions of my own from that. First off on basketball reference, it lists your nickname as the definition. Yeah. Can you co-sign on that? I can't co-sign on that, but I will <laughs> co-sign on it at the same time because it's really funny. It's because my last name's Webster. So Webster's dictionary, the definitions, <laughs> that's the reason why I got that. I, I'm, I'm assuming, but it was never once that I ever come in and like, the definition. That's the <laughs> <laughs> I never ever signed off on that being the official one. It's kind of like what the fans, what the fans gave me, I guess. Uh, I like it, man. So, so you're, you know, you're six foot eight. You're about, you know, two thirty playing weight, uh, and you were a thirty eight percent career three point shooter. Uh, so that to me, kind of. It seems like the typical three and D guy that is kind of in vogue uh, in the NBA that's kind of gotten really popular since uh, you know the Golden State Warriors started having the kind of success they had with their style of play. Uh, so Lillard for Mayor on Twitter asks, uh, "Do you have any desire to come back to the NBA uh, with the cap rising?" I guess I'll I'll, I'll put this out there. Um, so me and my my wife are, are getting kids are getting ready to move down to Los Angeles this week and actually I'm gonna go train. And it's not necessarily to come back to to get into the NBA at all. It, it's actually not. That's not the focus. It's just me getting back in shape and just feeling good and being in shape. But um, if uh, the opportunity presents itself and it has nothing to do with with the ridiculous amount of money that they're throwing out there right now, it has to do with me just being on a contending team, like you know having having an eleven year career and and seeing how hard it is to get to the postseason. Um, that's for me. It's got to be almost a definite thing that's going to happen. Getting to the postseason, the rebuilding phase is cool, but you know I've done that for for so many years. And having kids, it's just like yo, putting that energy is fun and all, but you know you want to be challenged and motivated to get to the next level. And you can't really get that if you're doing a lot of the teaching and being a part of the th- this new upbringing, this new um, kind of renaissance, sort of say. So I want to be on a team and in a position where it's like, okay, now I'm inspired to go out there and, you know, just really take it to the next level. So I have to be on a, on a contending team, but, um, just to put the bug out there, um, never really officially said I was retired. So I guess that's just something that people assume, but, um, it doesn't sound too bad, but I'm going to get my, 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 uh, body back into shape, just playing shape period. And if the, if the opportunity presents itself, the ideal opportunity, then who knows anything can happen. Mason Leonard on Twitter, he's one of our Australian listeners. Shout out to him. Uh, Ask, uh. <laughs> <laughs> ask who would you uh, cite as your main influences on the basketball court? Um, they're retired. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Michael Jordan was obviously the one that started um, that whole entire you know vision and, and passion for playing basketball. And um, you know, did '96. I was 10 years old. I mean, watching Kobe Bryant play, obviously. Allen I watching Allen Iverson is just like, you know, that's kind of like seeing a Pegasus. I don't think there's anybody, I don't think there will be another person to kind of transcend basketball the way he did in just such a raw and organic way. Um, I guess on the crunch, contrary would be Steph, Steph Curry. Um, watching him play has been amazing. But growing up, my, my, my idols were 
the retired ones, you know, Magic, um, Bird, Gary, Sean Kemp, obviously the Sonics. Um, yeah. That whole entire squad, that 96 squad. But, you know, Jordan Pippen and those guys, definitely. Um, Kobe. But, yeah, that, w- that would be my influence. All right, last question here. Uh, Patrick Gallagher on Twitter asks, uh, this is about music here. Uh, he wants to know if there's any chance that you're going to collab with uh, Dame Dalla in the future. <laughs> you know, it's funny, man. Dame is uh, definitely one of the coolest dudes uh, I've encountered. He's actually come up to my, my studio, and we've actually made music before. Nothing that we released, his cousin came up, and we spit a little bit. Um, so it, that me and him have actually collabed, I, I guess you would say, but definitely looking forward to putting something out there for, for everybody else to hear and just making art, man. It has nothing to do with, I don't really really get too much into the results or who's, who's going to be viewing it. I just kind of like put my, my shit out there and don't care. It's like, that's what you have to do. We have, we, I think we have to get back to the place where you're like making the art and just make, being responsible for your art. And, um, you know, for me, that's that's the most important thing. But Dame, man, I'm much respect to him and him going out there and just he was basically paying homage to to the sport. You can call it a sport, and um, not necessarily saying that he's better than anybody. He's just saying like, yeah, I can, I do this too, and I think that's really cool. Uh, he should keep doing it. And, you know, not not really care about what people are saying. There's going to be critics and spectators that aren't going to say the things that you may necessarily want to hear all the time. But that's just part of it. It's the balance, you know. All right, so that's Martel Webster. Uh, you can check him out on Twitter, at Martel Webster. Uh, the mixtape Art, which stands for uh, Anybody Can Relate to This, uh, comes out today. You can check that out on SoundCloud. Martel, I want to thank you very much for being so gracious with your time today. Hey, I appreciate it. And then I also, hey, Brandon, um, thank you. You know, Chris, thank you. You guys are awesome. I also want to uh, highlight the Emerald District uh, project, which is coming out. This was produced by Jake One. Um, and through Air Studios, it's coming out on August 12th. So keep an eye out for that. You guys already know about the art project, which is dropping today. And I hope you guys enjoy that. It's going to be some great music for your ears. I want to give a shout out to Neil Von Talley, who produced you know, all of art. Um, Charles Hopper out of Seattle that had collabed on it. Um, Justin Longerbeam, who's responsible for the whole mixing process and what's going on. And the entire Airs team, Mo, uh, that you guys met today, Taylor, um, and the Sean McDonald, our and our guys, just an amazing family. My wife are dealing with all my bullshit and everything that's going on with this whole entire process. <laughs> Love them all. Love you guys. Thanks for having me on the show, and I, I appreciate it. All right, thanks for joining us, man. Hopefully, we'll catch up soon. You guys, take it easy. Episode numero 154 of the Blazer's Edge podcast is now all wrapped up. We'd like to thank you very much for listening, and we'd also like to thank former Portland Trailblazer Martel Webster for coming on the show this week. Yeah, he was a super chill dude. Definitely appreciated having him on. And as a special treat, our intro and outro music is brought to you by Martel Webster. His mixtape drops today. It's called Art, and you can check it out on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, all those usual places. Be sure to check in with the Blazers Edge midweek podcast with managing editor Dave Deckard and contributor Dan Morang. And for Chris Lucia, I'm Brandon Goldner. Remember, when your buddies bring over all their jam equipment, pick up a trumpet, just start playing. <laughs>